If you scan the QR code, you can download today's presentation and follow along on your either Android or iPhone. If you do it correctly, you actually will save the presentation and you can reference it later. Boy, that's a big hit. I don't oh, know how to do that. I'm oh, I, I, I help. Help. We try to make this painless. But I've never been able to get it to work. Everybody get it? I'll show you. No, it's an yeah. iPhone. Okay, oh, turn yeah. on your camera. Oh, wait, wait for me to put it back on. Camera. Oh. Okay, he go? took it off. Uh, let me see if I accidentally okay. took a picture. Well, just a, a couple of quick oh. reminders. Oh, well. I'll Real show quick you reminders okay. here. Um, tomorrow night is our membership meeting. Um, there have been notices going out. Tomorrow is a little bit special. Um, we're doing our nomination for president elect. Kay has applied for the nominee position. So we're going to be doing nominee selections, and then we will go right into the election um, part of the process. So um, I'm just reminding everybody, it's election, which means we have to have 25% of the membership. It's not a whole bunch. We have 144. So that's about 30 people need to be here to do this. Okay, so keep that in mind. Please show up for that membership meeting. Last but not least, <laughs> Beth Smith is our presenter today, and Beth is one of our own. Um, she started gardening at age six, planting seeds and pulling weeds with her grandmother. Unlike me, I was eating all her tomatoes. Uh, she's extremely focused on raised bed gardening and hydroponics. Um, she's a graduate of the University of Virginia. She has her bachelor and master degree in art history and also her master's in education and math and her PhD in art history. She's an educator. She's a great little developer. So she is close to my heart. I love her. She's also a certified master gardener. She went through our master gardener class in 2013, so she's class of 2023. I don't believe I just said 2013. It's 2023. She graduated, and bang, right out of right out of it, she uh, took the uh, entomology course, uh, advanced training course, completed that, and now has an uh, entomology advanced training classification. So, if you would, please, let's welcome Beth. Hi, everyone. Hi. We're here to talk about hydroponics today, and this is one of my favorite topics, because it gives us the ability to grow food 12 months out of the year, and we don't have to worry about Texas weather. So let's get started. Well, what is hydroponics? Hydroponics is the process of growing plants in water. We add nutrients, we give them things to allow the roots to take hold, and basically we're growing things with water and nutrients, and that's all. It's derived from the Greek word meaning hydro, which is water, and ponos, which is to work or toil. <laughs> Don't think that that means you have to work and toil a lot with hydroponics. Well, how does a hydroponic system work? Well, plants are suspended in a pH balanced liquid that is full of nutrients. We use air stones and tubing to make sure that the roots of those systems are completely oxygenated. And we also recycle that water over and over over a period of time so that it can absorb all of the nutrients in the water that we're using. Hydroponics is really an economical way of growing things. It means you can actually use 75% of the recommended dose of fertilizer in a hydroponic unit. So you're saving on your fertilizer every time you use it. Where can hydroponics be used? In my opinion, everywhere. Individual households. It helps you maintain self-sufficiency if you're one of those people who likes to have fresh fruits and vegetables all the time. So it gives you a sustainable practice, and again, it can go on 12 months out of the year. 
They're wonderful for schools. I have put hydroponic units in classrooms. They're a wonderful way for teach, teachers to use, to teach those kids that there are alternative ways to grow in different things. I think they're really important to the community. And it's my understanding that the city of Seguin is actually putting some work into learning about hydroponics in some of their schools. But in the community, we can basically eradicate the use and need for fresh fruits and vegetables in the marginalized communities. I need to complain with this one. Constantly. 
this is really the only thing that separates <coughs> what you're doing in the ground with what you're doing in your hydroponics unit, is testing the water. Now, I know some of you probably test the water that you use anyway. You're testing for solids, you're testing for your pH. Some of us use nothing but collected water, rainwater. And if we use that, we're really in good shape working in a hydroponic unit because rainwater is perfect. We use all different kinds of growing medium when we work in a hydroponic unit. We've experimented with all kinds, and we found that there are some that work better than others. Really, when you're talking about the development of a plant, you're talking about a seed that's going to sprout a root system. And what that root system really needs more than anything is something to attach itself to. So we can give that root something to attach itself to by incorporating these elements in one of what you call your growing baskets. So instead of putting soil in here, we're going to fill it with one of these. Personal preferences after doing this for quite a while, these expanded clay balls are wonderful. Plus they're reusable. You can fill your cup up with these, put your seed in, cover it up with a little bit of coke core, and that's going to sprout, and it's going to use these pebbles to actually grab onto it. When you remove the plant from the basket, you're going to see that all of the roots have twisted and turned and encased themselves around these different pebbles. That doesn't hurt the plant. If you're going to transfer and put it into a pot with soil, you just very gently roll those little pebbles around and they'll just drop right off your root system. Another thing we really like to use is this cocoa core. This is really good if you have a particular vegetable that takes a lot of moisture in its root system. So if you're doing something like a basil, this is wonderful. I wouldn't use this on rosemary. What was the name of that? Cocoa core. It's really inexpensive. You can buy it at any garden store. It comes in a tiny little brick. You put it in a large container. And this tiny little brick is going to fill up your container with coconut oil because it just expands. Yes? Where can you find that clay, that expanded clay? This expanded clay, I get it all from Amazon. Amazon, okay, thank you. Everything we're going to talk about today, we can buy off of one of the shopping websites or one of the shopping apps. Another thing that we really like to use, especially if we're growing things that have a delicate root system that you know you're not going to disturb, Cucumbers are ones that come into mind because they don't like their root system disturbed. We use something called, excuse me, rock wool. Now this rock wool is basically what it is. It's rock granite that has been crushed and spun. And they put an adhesive in all of that, mix it up, and it creates this very fibrous material. And the roots find it very easy to sprout through this stuff. This does not degrade. So if you put it in your garden, when your plant is finished and you're pulling it out, you're going to see this is still in the root system. If it's not, you want to dig around in there and kind of pull it out. Because it will not degrade. It's stone. Now, you could crush it up real good in really small pieces and throw it in your composter and it kind of works like a vitreous clay, something that kind of expands and helps hold moisture in that compost. People like to use sand and vermiculite and perlite. I found that it is a little bit too fine to work really well in at least the hydroponic systems that we use. It has a tendency to gunk up the stones, the air stones. And if you're running a recirculating pump in it, it gets all into the filter of your pumps. But it's possible to use it. Because we use these baskets that have these huge holes in it, it's just not real practical for our use. Well, what are the advantages of hydroponics? 
because there's got to be an advantage, or why else would you want to go to the trouble of learning about this and even trying to attempt it at home? The one main thing is there are no soil-borne diseases in the plants you grow in this system. And unless you pick the bug up and bring it into your house and set it next to those plants, you're not going to have any infestations. You don't have to worry about worms on your squash. You don't have to worry about any kind of blister bug, blister beetles. None of those things are in your crops. You have uniform water availability to all your plants. So the plants that are in the center of your growing system are getting the same amount of water that the plants are in the outskirts of your watering system. You're able to use the space more efficiently because you're able to put plants really close side by side. As you can see in this unit here, this is an eight plant unit. Now if we were growing in the garden, we would put eight plants in a space this small. They would tangle each other. But we can do that in an aquaponics or a hydroponics unit. Hydroponic systems are dependent upon electricity because you have pumps that are going, you have air stones that are going all the time. So, if you have any problems, I think I skipped them. Yeah, I'm sorry, I skipped over. You can need less water for your nutrients. You can put heat and cool your zoning areas more efficiently. I know we grow in tents. And even though there's air conditioner in the room because your tents are sealed, all of your light is going to put off enough heat to really raise the temperature in your tent. My room can be set at 72 degrees. My tent usually runs around 89 degrees. That's too warm. So we put little chillers in the tent. And those little chillers take it back down to the proper temperature so that you're going to get a lot of growth. You're saying tent is what? I'll show you. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> An actual tent. Yeah. Okay. In my opinion, and in the opinion of a lot of people who use nothing but hydroponic grown food in their restaurants, I think you get a superior taste. You get a superior quality to your fruits and vegetables. And you can literally start plants that would usually take a good six months to mature, and you have mature plants in four. So there are a lot of advantages to using hydroponics. Well, of course, there are some disadvantages. The initial setup of a hydroponic system can be expensive. I know when we first got into it, we started looking at all the things that were required. We thought, oh my gosh, I don't know if I want to spend two or three thousand dollars on something that I'm going to experiment with. But we found there are a lot of ways to cut corners. A lot of places that you can buy things cheaper than going to the hydroponic store. Because if it has hydroponic store on it, I can almost guarantee you that they've marked it up about 25%. You can go to one of the shopping apps, find the exact same thing that the hydroponic store is selling, and instead of being $800, it's $150. So there really is a huge markup in the hydroponic units right now because they're becoming more popular. You do have limited production based on field crops. I'm not going to grow corn in my hydroponic unit. If I'm going to grow corn, I'm going to have to take it outside. So there are some limitations as to what you can grow. I've often wondered if it would work. I haven't been allowed to do that. <laughs> I may do it sometime soon. There is a certain amount of technical skill that's required in order to do a hydroponic system. Um, it's not really that big of a deal. Um, I feel like if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, because, you know, I've always been one of the people that get one of those credenzas that you need to put together. And the uh, instructions are really just an afterthought. So, uh, hydroponic gardens do depend on power. 
So you're going to have to make sure that you have a power source close by so that you can run all the things that you need to have a successful growing season. You also need to know that if something happens to one of your plants in your growing bed, all of your growing bed is gone. Because there's no way, because it's sharing the nutrients, it's sharing the water source, that one plant's going to get sick and the rest of them are going to be okay. That is a benefit to me. Because as soon as I see something wrong with one of the plants in this unit, this unit comes out of the tent, it's completely just, you know, the plants are taking out of it. I don't even put them in my composter. This unit is completely disinfected and ready to go again. I don't try to salvage anything because what I'm going to do is carry over that disease. A lot of cross-contamination I found comes in the tools we use, the scissors. At first I had a real bad habit of needing a pair of scissors outside or a pair of clippers and I'd run in and get it out of a hiding pond closet. And I'd take it outside and I'd use it. Then I'd forget to clean it and throw it back in the hiding pond closet. And then I'd get it out and start trimming. And then all of a sudden I had spider mites. How did spider mites get in my tent? I brought them in on those clippers. So I have to make sure I clean my tools. At this point, I have an outside set of tools and I have an inside set of tools. I still clean them between each row unit. So if I have six row units like this in my tent, I'm going to clean my tools after every single one. Because I may, again, not notice something is in here and transfer it and know it. And because these are growing so quickly, a disease can wipe out something in just a matter of probably about 12 to 18 hours. It really goes fast. Yes? A question. <clears throat> it may not have any bearing to it, but you know, on the news there's so much lately about, you know, so much of the food is listeria. <laughs> so is that less of a chance of in that? I never, I'm bred. All the books I could find on high times, I have never read anything about a hysteria outbreak. In my opinion, this is the cleanest way you can grow your food. Yeah. If you're sensitive to any kind of chemicals, like fertilizers or pesticides that could be sprayed on the fruits and vegetables by a commercial farmer, you're not going to run into any of those problems here. Unless, of course, you intentionally do it yourself. Waterborne diseases, airborne diseases, they all work the same. One happens, the whole thing's got to go. If your hydroponic unit fails, you're going to have problems with everything in your tent. So you need to make sure you have a backup. Us, we have a little generator, a little solar generator. That way I know if any of the power goes out of my house, I take it into the plant room and I start <coughs> unplugging things from the wall and plugging it into the generator. My refrigerator will be fine. I can go without TV, but my plants can't go without their oxygen. So they're always my priority. Heck with the dogs and anybody else in the house. <laughs> 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 Not exactly. 24 hours, power. It is a 24 hour. All right, types of hydroponic systems. We have four basic systems. We have a wake system, a water culture system, an ebb and flow system, and then an aeroponic system. Most units are a combination of these. So let's see it, what makes them different. This is a wick system, simple. Take a big five gallon water bottle, chop it off, put the spout upside down. Stick a wick in the bottom. You have your wick going through here, your soil and plants here, here's water. We can even call this a little aquapotic system because we have a goldfish swimming down here <laughs> sucking up all the nitrates in the water. So the water goes up into these plants. It is nice and clean. That's the simplest, takes no electricity, takes very little care. You just gotta make sure your water's tested your pH is right, you have the right nutrients, you're feeding the fish, you're good to go. The water culture system is probably the one that you use the most, or a combination of a couple of little things added to the water culture system. The water culture system is where you have a container, 
you fill it full of nutritious water, you have a top on it that works as a raft. In this case, I don't have to because the lid actually fits on top of the container. But you can use a raft system, a piece of styrofoam you cut round holes in so that your net baskets can go in. You're going to plant your plants. You have an air stone that's providing all kinds of <clears throat> oxygen to your plants, and you're ready to go. Pretty simple, isn't it? Yeah. The ebb and flow system adds a component. Instead of having this in a constant wash of water 24 hours a day, it's going to periodically put water through your system. So these are going to be dry except for the tips, and then it's going to get flushed with water because a pump is going to pump out of the reservoir and fill this up. It'll slowly, over a few hours, drain. Just about the time it's ready to be completely empty, the pump turns back on and fills it back full of water. That goes on every four hours, 24 hours a day. That's the ebb and flow system. The only thing you're adding to there is the pump. Yes? Are there certain plants that need that system as far as that are preferred system? No, I don't really think so. Oh. I have never found, it, in my experience, this is a difficult system to run because I feel like if these can't get water all the way up to the basket, I'm depriving a lot of my root system of water. And that root system is really important to the development of that stem system and all those leaves that are going to help provide all the chlorophyll that I need to grow. But as I say, a lot of these systems are combinations. They'll take a little piece of one and add it to another. What we do at home is we use the water culture system and we add a pump to it. So that every so often, the water goes directly into the top of the loop rather than from the bottom up. And that will happen several times a day. So it's just adding one more component to what you already have. Then the aeroponic system, it's much like the ebb and flow. You're not going to have a container that is full of water that they're constantly sitting in. Every so often these misters are going to go off. And those misters are going to inundate your root systems with water. I have never used this. It's my understanding it's difficult to control with the sprayers. Maybe when I graduate to the next level. Okay, what I use at home. I think the problem is we fiddle with this thing. Okay. We use commercially made tanks and not commercial made. The commercial made tanks are great because they come to you ready to go. We also um, use tanks that we make in the garage. I know I've got some, you know, like 25 gallon totes to cut a hole in, put a basket in, cut some holes in the basket, fill it full of water, put some plants in it, you're ready to go. Only a few tools are needed, which is great. And you can grow vegetables 12 months out of the year, which is what excites me about this. Growing in buckets is one of my favorite. Now, you don't have to necessarily have an orange bucket, but the orange buckets do look nice in your tent. <laughs> when you use these grow buckets, you need a gallon, at least a five gallon bucket. Anything smaller than that, you're going to be doing herbs. Okay? You can have a two gallon bucket and you can grow basil, you can grow rosemary, you can grow thyme, all you want because the root system is very shallow. If you've got a tomato plant though, you need a five gallon bucket because it's not going to be long that this entire bucket's going to be full of roots. And you can also, if you want lights, we do all kinds of stuff with cheap lights we get from Walmart and PVC pipe. And this was all something we made. And then we take it apart because
is one opportunity for something else. You have the whole Actually, this is a pre-manufactured piece. And then I'll tell you about how to get those. You can use your hydroponic systems to start all of your plants. Then you can take every single one of your plants and transfer them into dirt. As soon as they're hardened off, they're ready to go outside and be planted in your garden. I know I'm starting a lot of fall vegetables for various gardens. Everything is in a hydroponic unit right now. In about four weeks, I'll take everything out and put them into soil. And then they'll go in my little cabinet here that has nice lights and self-contained. And it'll percolate in there until I get a nice new ball and they're ready to transplant. Grow lights. I use LED grow lights. The old tungsten bulb grow lights are hot. Yeah. I don't know how people would keep your tent cool enough to grow vegetables in it unless you got one of those standing air conditioners. Because I've seen tents get over 100 degrees with one of those lights in it. And that's the only thing causing any temperature increase. So we use the LED lights. And yes, the LED lights still increase the temperature inside your tent. It uses very little electricity. I cannot tell the difference on my electric bill when I have my lights plugged in or when I have them unplugged. Because there will be certain times of the year that I will literally empty everything, everything gets a good scrub and we start from scratch. And when I have those turned off for those weeks, I don't need any extra money. The lights can come in various different forms. Here's a light that's very focused. For a small area, everybody's probably used one of these desktop if you ever use the Aero Gardens. That's what I had in college. And then you can get something that is a huge bank of lights. The largest one we have is a 2 by 4 foot bank. We use a 3 by 2 foot bank, and then we use a 2 by 2 foot bank, depending upon where we're doing it. You want to make sure that your light covers the square footage of the bottom of the tent. Here are grow tents and cabinets. Cabinets come in all sizes, shapes, and configurations. They look like gun safes or a filing cabinet. A lot of people have said that they look like both. And then here's one of the tents. The good thing about the tents is they all have reflective interiors, so you're maximizing the sun reflection for your plants. The one reason I use, we grow lots and lots of herbs. And you know that herbs are very aromatic. There are times when you walk in our house and it literally smells like somebody hits you in the face with basil. <laughs> I mean, it can really be intense. And it gets in your clothes and it'll be like, oh, do you work in an Italian restaurant? <laughs> so we use a tent. It has a filtration system inside that you plug in. So it's scrubbing the air as it leaves the tent and goes into your room. So I can take all that stinky basil, rosemary, thyme, whatever I'm doing, all that mix of smells that at some point gets kind of earthy and not that nice. Put them in the tent, zip it up, turn that system on. I don't smell anything. So it completely scrubs your air. I guess that's how all the people in California got by with growing all that wacky weed over there and nobody could smell it. Commercially grown, commercially made containers are great. They're fairly expensive. When we started out with these containers, I bought a couple of these and they ran about $250 a piece. Wow. Now, this comes preset. I mean, the, the top fits on it so you don't have to worry about anything leaking. It's got its own drain port so I can turn the pump on and turn this valve and actually empty itself. You know, it's got the top feeding sprayer, so I can put a pump to it and water will come through those every so many hours and water the very top of the root ball. So these, these are nice, but you can make them. This particular unit right here will work as good as this unit, if not better, because I have a lot of room to grow here. This is called a net hat. You can buy them offline. There is a place in Manshack, if you're familiar with Austin, south of Austin, 
There's a store there, and it's a hydroponic store. He has these things. They're the cheapest that I found them there. These are about $6 a piece. So with a bucket and a hat, I've got less than $10. I'm doing the same thing that I spent $250 for. The only thing I have to do with this is I have to have an air pump. These will come in different sizes. I have to have an air pump, and I have to have air stones. What's that? This is an air stone. What's that? This gets a piece of black tubing that's attached to this. The other end gets attached to the other end of the tube. And this is going to blow air through the tube. It blows through this stone and it expands it and it adds oxygen to it, so it's putting out bubbles. Oh, okay. And that's going to oxygenate your tank. How does it work with that Home Depot thing, or does it? Oh, does yeah, it works with Home Depot very good. All I had to do, I had it left on this one because I haven't used it with this unit. All I have to do is take it and cut a little notch out here uh -huh. on the side. So my electrical cord can go Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, but with these, that was only for a pump. These are outside. Yeah. So the only thing you're doing is drilling little holes so your quarter-inch pipe can go through. Do you put a timer or that thing runs 24-7? This runs 24-7. Wow. And again, this is not going to take any electricity significance on this bill. Yeah, because it's just... Does your air stone go in the... The air stone goes in here. Yes. Okay. Now, on this little unit right here, I would use two stones, one at the front and one at the back. On one like this, I would have a couple of stones that were this big. They're very large. And I would put two in there. Because I have five gallons of water in here, a little over four and a half. Where here, I've only got two and a half. So I've got to make sure that water's moving, moving that oxygen around. Yes? So when you have that, your display that you have or your garden that has like the six buckets, uh -huh. and then each one of those would have an air stone. Yes. So, and then do you just branch off of your pump that would? Yes, this one will branch off to two, to two air stones. Okay. I have got one, and hopefully we'll be able to show you. And these are the homemade containers. Again, the buckets, and here's, here's one with the big tote. And really, there weren't anything purchased there. I took some old plastic uh, buckets that I'd taken plants out of, and I took an X-Acto knife and just cut strips out of it and stuck it in there, and it worked just fine. <clears throat> this kind of pump right here, if you look at it, this is the kind of pump I'm showing you now. That's really, you've got a maximum of probably two air stones on the smaller pumps. This pump like this, they're pretty expensive. That runs about $80. But I can run six things off of it. I can have six of these running off of one of those. Where if I use these, I would have half six of them. Or one for each bucket. Or two for two for one, right? There, yeah. You want to have yep. Yeah. One of these with the two is going to need one bucket. Cause I'm gonna, yeah, because I'm going to put two air stones in that bucket. Oh, okay. Really, unless you're dealing with a very small space, two air stones is really the minimum. Got it. Okay. Air stones come in all kinds of configurations. I even have some air stones that are long. They were good in the tubs. Because you can get them that are almost two feet long. And you can put them right down in the bottom, and it'll give you a rub of the bubbles. Water. Can't tell you enough about how important it is to test your water. We had crops die miserably because we didn't pay close enough attention to the water. First thing you're going to do is you're going to test your water and get you a little kit. And it's going to have this pH test indicator in a little container. You're going to fill the container about halfway full of the water that you plan on putting into your grow container. You put four drops of this in it. 
and it has a little scale over here that you can take a look at. If it's yellow, it's groovy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you want to be, a nice bright yellow. That's going to put you right in the perfect zone for your plants in your unit. I don't know what that signifies. It's around the 6.5 area. I have so many things to fill when I'm doing it, I'm not going to sit there and determine whether it's 6.5 or 6.0. So yellow works. After you test, you're going to find out whether or not your water suitable to put in the grow tank. If it's not, if it's above the 7.5, it's below 6. You're going to have to amend the water. And this is what you call a pH up and down kit. The blue bottle is if your pH is too low and you need to bring it up. Yellow if it's too high and you want to bring it down. Here in Seguin, it's the rest of the blue. The only thing we use is the yellow. Because our water here has extremely high pH. So we're constantly, uh, we buy, this is, I've been doing this full time now for three years. This is my original bottle. <laughs> I probably use, what, two, three gallons of this? Wow. So this is all you use. comes with this little cute thing so you can suck it up and do it by drops. That's how we measure it. So you put in a few drops, test it. Put in a few drops, test it. After you do that a couple times, you're going to learn exactly how many drops you put in your water because your water is going to be consistent. So at this point, we know it takes 21 drops in the two liter bottles that we use to fill our containers to bring the pH down to where it needs to be. Wow. You'll do the same thing. It's just a matter of observing what you do. Feeding your plants. Feeding plants is so vital at this point because all your babies are getting is water. They don't have any of that soil that even has trace elements in it. It's just plain old water. So you gotta feed them. The types of fertilizers that we use that come in the box stores, come in big bags, it is not appropriate for this use. You are going to use stuff that unfortunately was produced for the illegal growers. <laughs> because they have fine-tuned this stuff, folks. I mean, they really have. Um, they have created an industry where literally you have different selections that you can increase the magnesium in your water if you want to. You can strip all the calcium out of your water if you want to. And it all depends on what kind of chemicals you have. We use several different types, and the only reason I brought these two is because they represent what you can find in powder form, and then what you find in liquid. This particular distributor does everything in powder form. We like these. We can buy a large container like this, and it'll last for quite a while. Plus, I have two grumpy dogs, and I don't want containers of fertilizer sitting around that they might you know, want to sniff and lick. So these are nice. This stuff is awesome. I mean, there is no doubt that this particular company provides you with an excellent product. But there are just as many products out there who are just as good. To me, price is the motivating factor. If I look at what this contains, and I get online and look for something cheap, if it's got the same stuff in it, it's going to work the same. I don't have to pay for a highly marketized product. So I can do that. The dry and the liquid have so many different formulas and configurations. You can be pretty selective. I like to divide it up into three zones. I have a growth zone where I'm spending all of my time developing root systems. Then I have a time where I'm growing the stem and I'm putting out leaves. I'll change the formula a little bit. By the time my things are starting to bloom, I've really changed my formula up altogether. And I've converted it over to something that's going to produce good fruit. I even go to, go to
go to the extent that once I'm ready to take the plant and remove it, I will give it a dose of what they call cow mag, and I'll see if I can coax it just another couple weeks to give me a few more tomatoes. <laughs> so you can do stuff like that with your chemicals. You can really either shorten or extend the amount of time that you can actually work with your plants. <clears throat> Harvesting really isn't different than it is when you're working in your own garden. You're not going to have huge baskets full of stuff like this, but you're going to have something that you can have for a couple of meals. And for two people, that's pretty cool. We can go in and have enough lettuce at any time that we can make salads for both of us. We know that in a couple days it's going to regenerate and we can have salad again. Harvesting this, the only real difference is, is that I know when I harvest things, if I'm done with a tomato plant or a cucumber or a pepper, I'm going to take it and I'm going to cut it off the root. Sometimes I leave the root there to dissolve and you know, put nutrients back in the soil. I need the spot though that thing comes out. It's hard to tell when we're working in soil how long that particular root's longevity may last. Because those roots are hidden from you the whole time. When you're growing in one of these, you have constant access to their roots. You can examine them constantly. If your roots are not white and pretty, and clean looking, there's a problem in your head. And you need to start diagnosing what that problem is. Also, because you're growing in a small space, <laughs> you're going to take your scissors and you're going to start trimming down those root balls. Every time you trim down that root ball, it's going to trick the plant into thinking, uh oh, I gotta start all over again. <laughs> so, you get another couple weeks. Take the chance, trim it again, see if you can get a little more. We have been successful in growing asparagus for consumption in one year. Most asparagus plants take three. We can put it out ready to eat in one. Tomatoes, if you're not careful, you want to use a bush variety. <laughs> but if you're not careful, before long, everything's covered with tomatoes, and you have more tomatoes than you know what to do with. <laughs> yeah, it's all the time. <laughs> so, when you're thinking about cutting that top off, don't pull that root out of the solution so fast. See if you can get another growth on it. It might be in a week. It's the exact same way you left it when you cut it off, in which case you'll pull it up, throw it out, right. clean your tag, and start over again. But you'd be amazed how many things you think are done. You trim them down, prune them down really hard, and it'll come back. It's really surprising. When you're finished cleaning your equipment is vital, you gotta clean it, you gotta clean it well. You don't stick it in a tub of dish soap. There are oils in the dish soap that could possibly cause harm to the roots of the plants. It could coat the actual root system and keep it from being able to suck up any nutrients. So you don't want any soap chemicals in your buckets. What we do is we take them, we empty them, throw them in the bathtub, fill the bathtub up, and then pour about six bottles of peroxide in it. The peroxide is the best thing to use because it's going to kill all of your bacteria, you rinse it good and it's not going to leave anything behind that could interfere with the growing of your plants. So no alcohol, no soap, just peroxide. We would like to use scrub brushes, especially on these, because they will get kind of yucky and scummy. Because again, they're sitting in that nice little nutrient pool you have in that bucket. So you want to scrub these real good. If you're using black or green tubing, you can use this stuff over and over and over and over and over again. Because algae's not going to grow in this. It's got no light source. If you're using a clear tubing, like you find at Walmart, that you would use a fish tank, after each crop, or after you finish growing, when you're cleaning this unit, you're going to have to throw all that clear tubing away. 
then you'll start all over again with more two. So it's best to just start out with the black or the green. Yes? On the hydrogen peroxide, can you buy a bigger bottle instead of like a small one? Oh, yeah. How big a size you want to get? So, uh, the plant, so the water life is one plant cycle. Like you, is that right? Yes. Okay. Now, you're, if, if your plants are in there for more than a week, you're going to have to top off your tanks. Okay. And again, when you top off your tanks, you're going to test the water. You're going to put in the water. You're going to test it again. And then you're going to put the nutrients in it that you need. Because every time the water's low, you know that it's evaporated some of the nutrients out. So you're going to feed them regularly every week. What we do is we top the tanks every week, and we feed them at the same time. Makes sense. Yes. Are you removing the plants when you top it off? Nope. Or they're not that sensitive? Like nope. with a fish tank, you have to take the fish out nope. and get it back. Nope. Okay. So you leave the now, just for you know, cleanliness sake, I'll take this off and pour it in and then put it back in. I just have to have a bucket I can set this into because it's got all these dripping you know, roots underneath it. Yes. Okay, so with that hat, yes. you call it a net hat. Yes. What do you put in there before you put the plant? You're going to put rock roots? Oh, you're going to put that. Yes. Ah, okay. Now, I've probably sprouted my plant in this. Okay. So I'm going to take this out of this. I'm going to pull it all out of here. And I'm going to put it in here. And I'm just going to put around like it was soil. Just sprinkle it around it. Yeah. Put it around the top, cover the roots. If it's rock wall, if you can't, if you can't see the rock wall anymore, you know you got enough pebbles in there. You want to put the pebbles all the way to the top, though. Because remember, any kind of light that gets into your tank is going to grow algae. And this is full of holes. So you need to make sure that you fill that with enough of these pebbles that the light's not getting through. And you can tell that by just setting it up to your light and looking through it and seeing if you can see any light through it. It's an easy test. But I use this as an anchor for the roots. I use this to sprout my little babies in because it's easy to put the seed in, cover them up. This stays nice and wet. And when it's done, I just stick it in and act like it's a little root system. Put it in the container. You'll want to dedicate a scrub brush to it, just like your tools. Don't use your scrub brush for anything other than cleaning your tanks. Now all you have to do is enjoy it. You've done all the hard work, harvest your food, and enjoy it for your labor. And believe me, you will enjoy it. There is nothing better than coming in after a rough day outside messing in the garden to go to this nice clean spot, cut some lettuce, I don't have to wash it, I can stand there and eat the tomatoes right off the line. Don't have to worry. It's really cool. Yes? I see carrots up there. How do you grow carrots if you're if they're limited to basket? Actually, you can. You can not actually submerge the top part and use one of the aeroplane techniques and the carrots actually suspend from the roots in that system. They're suspended. Wow. Would yeah. that be true for potatoes? Potatoes as well. Yeah. I also know people that have done beets and turnips. Oh wow. So yeah, it all depends on how you configure the bed that you want it to grow in. And again, one of those four types is going to work for what you need to do. A combination of those four types sometimes works a little bit better. And as you work with the hydroponic system, you'll find that it's, it's easy to get these, this plastic tube and run things. Hook it up. Our only big challenge is making sure the floor is dry when we finish. <laughs> and we do everything. Our, our entire brew room is in a room with carpet. <laughs> oh, we have it, it's in air conditioning? Yes. Yeah. We have a room in our house that is dedicated to nothing but hot pockets. And then I have a cabinet in my office that is my grow cabinet that I start my seedlings in. And then if I put any in soil, that's where they keep it. I need one of those grow cabinets. Now, if you have any questions, Please do not hesitate to contact me. 
You can contact me through EMS. There's my email address. Contact me if you have any questions. If you are feeling really enthusiastic and you decide you want to give it a try and grab you a couple of buckets, give me a call. I'll come over and help you get it started. I'll show you how to measure your chemicals. I'll show you how to top off your tanks. I'll show you how to make it all nice and happy. So whatever you're growing, you can literally grow 12 months. Yes? Turn your hair off, no squash. How would you do that? I would put them in a tomato cage. I would take this bucket, and I, I'd take it to the very bottom that sticks it to the ground, cut those little palms off, and then set it over the top of the bucket, put a couple of zip ties on it, plant the squash. Squash is right up here. <coughs> What about putting, uh, um, like, um, the squash uh, worms, you know? We don't, we don't have, you don't have squash worms in my pond. They don't exist, unless you bring them outside. Julie is the only way to do it. Feel free to get in touch with me. I don't know everything there is to know. I don't know that anybody knows. This has been around for a long time, so we've only gotten popular in the past 30 years. There isn't a whole lot of literature out there, but there is some. So feel free to take a look at what's out there. Give me a call if you have any questions. And enjoy. I hope all of you have had a good hour. Thank you for being here. Is it a formula, or how do you know how many air cells to what container? If it's a container, any container I put it in has got two stones. Oh, so all of them have two stones. All of them stones. have two stones in it. Mm -hmm. If I were to double this, I would put four stones in it. Okay. So I put basically a stone per gallon of water. Okay, one mm -hmm. stone per gallon. Yeah. Now, the stones themselves, though, can be very different. Right. A large stone can handle a lot more water than this one can. Okay. So when I'm looking at a stone to go in here, it's literally that big. And those are, are those like dedicated uh, hydroponics or we can no, use aquariums? They're on Amazon. Okay. Yeah. I already checked. They're, they're all on Amazon. Amazon. Yep. Everything's okay. on Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Every single thing. I already checked. Awesome. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, real quick. Um, don't run away, Ben.